Hi, it's Kara again. Um, I wanted to say thank you for everyone who took the time to watch my last video. And also wanted to try to do a shorter format that hopefully will be more helpful than just my opinion about things. Um, a few years ago I taught a class um, for therapists about uh, potential indicators that they, they may have an adult that meets criteria to be sent out for further testing for ASD. And I was just going to share some of those traits with you to see if, um, if any of them resonated. Again, these are not diagnostic in any way. They can mean a whole bunch of different um, pathologies, but they are some things that folks who have made it to adulthood, usually with level one autism, without being diagnosed, have had a lot of experience with. I will try to keep it brief, although one of the challenges with autism is uh, in talking about a special interest, mine being autism, I have kind of a difficult time keeping things brief because I get intrigued and involved. But um, so 10 traits of adults uh, that may need to be sent for testing for level one autism. One. Their level of employment does not match their level of education. I've worked with many people that have master's degrees um, that are unable to hold down employment in places like Walmart and Target. Um, these are brilliant people uh, that can talk to you about whatever their special interest is. Uh, they can speak to you in dead languages, but that are unable to hold stock jobs at night. Um, because they require interacting with other, other, with people who are neurotypical and cues get read wrong. Okay. Two, they may be late to marry or be in a committed relationship. That's speaking again to meeting developmental milestones later, which is typical in an autism diagnosis. And when I say late to marry or be in a committed relationship, we're talking people who, Marry in their 40s, 50s for the first time. Maybe, um, I know I didn't have a significant relationship till I was in my 40s. That's um, so what we're talking about there. Three is difficulties with employment. Um, a lot of getting fired and not really understanding what happened. Um, difficulties with job interviews, thinking that thing, they went really, really well, and then just not hearing back. Um, I've had clients that have applied for literally hundreds of, 100 to 200 jobs in a year for years at a time, going for things that were minimum wage, going for things that were in line with their education and were never able to get, uh, to get hired. Um, Four, appearance differences. This one's kind of judgmental in a way. Like, that's not my favorite thing. But if, uh, you know, it may be that someone on the spectrum or that may be on the spectrum will wear the same clothes for three days a week. Uh, and, it may, and that may be fine. Also, it may be that one day they're wearing those clothes to work and one day they're wearing them to a funeral um, the idea that they're different social mores and that different clothes fit those social mores. Um, I will use an example from my life. Um, I had to be told, luckily as a nurse, you get to wear scrubs. So there's not a whole lot of, uh, you look like everybody else, um, which is nice. But, um, once I got a job where I was wearing street clothes, um, it was business casual. I had no idea what that meant. So I literally had um, a coworker who had a child on the spectrum sit down with me and explain simple things like a collared shirt is more formal than a scoop neck shirt, like a t-shirt. Um, so there were just things that I didn't understand were rules. Um, sensory issues is number five. This is huge. Uh, and we're not talking like a little, eh, every once in a while I get a shirt where the tag bothers me and I cut it out. We're talking about 
perhaps someone in their 30s who's never worn socks, um, not being able to go to a hotel room because the sheets on the bed, the texture is wrong. It's too rough. Um, not being able to use public uh, pool towels because of the texture of the towels. Um, sensory, it can be so many different things. Uh, light, definitely folks who are very photosensitive, um, who, who seem to always need to have sunglasses. And if they, don't, if they forget their sunglasses, if they become very agitated um, or even angry or even like the day is just ruined, the event is ruined. Um, and then sensory issues relationship to touch is another big one. Um, people who don't like hugging, they don't, and there are people who just don't like hugging and that's, that's fine. It's not a pathological thing by any means. Um, but the idea of when someone is in pain, their nervous system does, someone with ASD's nervous system oftentimes will do the opposite of a neurotypical person's to where touch makes things worse. Um, stimming makes things better. Stimming releases dopamine. It calms the nervous system. But touch oftentimes will deplete the dopamine and the neurotransmitters in the brain even more and make things worse. Um, so let's see here. What else we got? So those are the top five. And then we go to six. And forgive me for looking again. This is truncated down from a probably two-hour lecture. So uh, lack of flexibility, which is a huge one. Um, say continually at work um you know the meeting's supposed to be at nine we have a nine o'clock meeting and then one day the boss is held, held up in traffic or gets a flat tire and it's a nine suddenly it's an, a 9 30 meeting and the employee cannot handle the shift um oftentimes a, a, a longer lead-in to the change will make it better but i have definitely seen people fired over lack of flexibility people with autism, many, many times. Um, okay, um, you know, today we're short staffed. So we're gonna actually move you down the hallway. We're gonna, instead of having you stock the toy department like you normally do, you're gonna stock uh, gardening. I've, I've seen like that, that could cause the loss of a job. Um, just that inability to switch gears and that's in all aspects of life. Again, what makes autism autism is it's pervasive. It could be, um, your, your, your wife said that you were going to have dinner. She was going to have dinner ready at six and you get home from work at six and something came up with the kids and dinner's not ready at six and there's an explosion, there's a, there's, a, there's a verbal explosion, there's a blow up, it's very disproportionate to the actual thing that happened. But so adults that have these, that, that lack of flexibility that is that extreme, uh, oftentimes to the point of on the floor crying um, in meltdown could mean they need to be assessed for autism. People, it's the seven, this one's one of my favorites, people on the spectrum tend to be very literal um, also like people with computer brains or engineer brains tend to be very literal. So it's a good example of how these aren't diagnostic. They're just things to, to think about and to look for and, and to perhaps ask some more questions if you're hitting a lot of these, um, very literal, like a child, uh, not that this is a good example, but what do you, another child saying, would well, you want me to hit you or something? And the kid's saying, no, like they literally think they're being asked if they want to be hit. Um, I know there's a lot of good examples of this one. Um, and, and in fact, I feel like I bet a lot of people could put some good examples of this one in the comments. Uh, and I'll have to ask some people around me because I know I'm very, very, very guilty of this one. Um, I take things literally and then I think something's happening that's not like... Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be in a um, conflict with someone and they'll be like, I'm right here. I'm here. And to me, it's like, yes, you're here. That's the part of the problem. I need to be alone. I need you to give me space. But what they're trying to relay is it's okay that 
you're having a meltdown, I'm still here. So that literalness creates a disconnect, which is part of the dis-ease, the disease of autism. Um, I don't know, we actually, I think, made this one longer than the first one. Sorry, guys. But uh, it's good information. Number eight, uh, intricate knowledge fixation on specific topics, like special interests. We've all heard about this. Yeah, it, with, it can be, you know, with little kids, Thomas the Train Engine, to where they know everything about it. Um, this sometimes gets blown out of proportion, like just knowing like who starred in all the Star Wars movies and all the Star Wars TV shows on Disney+. Plus. That could or could not be a special interest. If you know who produced them all and who the director of cinematography was and which, um, which plot points were actually supposed to be in which movies that got moved to different television shows later because they were edited out, that's a special interest. It's above and beyond. It's a fi- it's, it's, and it brings immense joy to be able to talk about those special interests to people who have them. So again, the, the fixation on an intricate knowledge of a specific topic, we're not just talking being smart about something. We're, we're talking about having information that it would take the average person 20 to 30 minutes to Google to find one piece of information. All right, number nine. Intense reactions and or overreactions to change. We've talked a little about that with the, the meeting, the hypothetical meeting that changed from 9 to 9.30. Um, yeah, this one's tough. This one's especially tough um, because it, it, it loses connection. It loses friendships. It brings on a lot of guilt and shame. Um, you know, uh, it's, it can be very difficult in a marriage if a new child is born and the routine is, is suddenly off from what it's been. Uh, that, that's a huge change, and that I think is true of, of neurotypical people as well. But um, just an overreaction to a change. Like, for instance, um, I have a friend where every Monday night for the last eight years we eat dinner. Every Monday night for the last eight years, we eat dinner at the same restaurant and order the same thing until COVID happened. Uh, that was very difficult. We continued to order out from the same restaurant and order the same thing. But that change took... Uh, COVID's been over a few years now, and I, I, I still don't think we've adapted to that change. Um, it's long-lasting, the problem. And then 10, uh, this one's sad, uh, but also really gives you some insight into why this diagnosis shouldn't be thrown around lightly, which is when polled by, um, it's an organization called Spark, and they do, they're the main researchers in autism in the US. Uh, one of the main indicators for adults with ASD was they're unsure of the status of friendships. Not knowing if someone's your friend or not. So I saw this a lot. Uh, I had the opportunity to teach middle school health and um, with a young man there who was on the spectrum who would sit with the, the, the more popular boys in the back and they were bullying him. They were writing notes that were inappropriate to him but they were laughing when he would answer. And so he thought they were his friends, which was very painful because at some point that child is going to, there's, there's an intervention and that child realizes that he's, those kids aren't, aren't his friends. Um, I also see this a lot with, um, Folks who are who are on the spectrum who don't really have friends they hang out with in person before COVID even, but they have like oh that's my best friend oh yeah when, like when was the last time you saw them we went to a movie you oh you go to movies that's a great thing to do together when was the, what was the last movie you saw oh I don't know it was like two or three years ago 
Um, so like this idea of not being able to sustain friendships because well, for lots of reasons, we're at 15 minutes, so I don't want to go too far over uh, the rubric, but those are 10 really, 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 really stripped down traits of a presentation that I gave to therapists of if you have clients that are presenting this way, you may want to send them out to be evaluated for ASD. Um, I look forward to hearing any comments that you might have, and I sincerely appreciate your time. Uh, hope these aren't things you're struggling with, but if they are, please post in the comments what I can do to try to get you some more information to try to get you some help. Thanks.